Dr. Huda um, works as a consultant psychiatrist in the National Health Service in a deprived area in the east of Manchester in the UK. In addition to general adult psychiatric patients, much of his clinical work is devoted to the Early Intervention Psychosis Service. Although he's from Scotland, he has lived in England for half his life and has also spent about a year working as a, a psychiatrist in Australia. He's the author of The Medical Model in Mental Health and Explanation and Evaluation. He also has an interest in philosophy of mental health. Away from work, he's a Liverpool FC fanatic and is hopeful that Scotland will return to the World Cup. Sammy, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Okay, so um, I put classification mental health problems, and the, the main topic the main here is the many ways of classifying mental health problems, and um, which issues will depend on several kind of important factors, and we'll go through some of them. And also, um, it's okay to ask me to slow down. I, I'm not sure the timings of this, so I might undershoot or overshoot, but yeah, if I'm speaking too fast, it's all right to ask me to slow down. Um, so nosologomania, the idea that doctors, psychiatrists, particularly are obsessed with the classification of mental health problems, and I probably suffer from that issue. Um, summary of the talk, why do we classify? different systems such as no classification, diagnosis, dimensional symptoms, network, geographic, idiomic, and conclusions. One or two other ones that are also there that are on that list. Um, so why do we need classification? Um, so it allows communication between professionals. Um, it's got administrative purposes. Those are probably the two main purposes and people are asked. So for admin, it's like, if you have to record like discharge summary or activity level uh, rec records. But the other important use of classification is it allows groups to be fine to research to gain information on such subjects, such as range of life outcomes, what kind of responses you can expect to different treatments, what other important features are associated with, it, with this uh, classified problem. Uh, maybe even things about the causes of the classified problem. Other issues, particularly for diagnosis, is like it may be necessary to get eligibility care, also eligibility for benefits. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit later on, but basically um, a lot of systems around mental health are health systems, and they'll basically standardise the same sort of administrative system as physical health. Because uh, it was just too complicated to have two completely different types of classification. Um, so they'll tend to be, the administrative side tends to be around diagnosis. Um, and one of the reasons for having a standardized classification is hopefully it will reduce the potential for abuse. Um, so, for example, the Soviet Union came up with sluggish schizophrenia, which is basically used to diagnose people who didn't believe in communism. So, unfortunately, like the US Constitution, it's fine on paper, but Whatever you how it's how you practice. Um, local practices can subvert the intentions. So the US Constitution, obviously, it said that all men are born equal, etc. And they had slavery. So, you know. Anyway, so uh, a, a theme behind this talk is a concept of promiscuous reality. And that's the idea that different ways of viewing the same sort of issue can illuminate different aspects. And often multiple ways are know are needed to get more and more information about a subject um, and there's also different ways of viewing how problems can present or the causes of problems um, and these are all called be useful uh, and they're not mutually exclusive um, and the idea is that um, pragmatic realists recognize different depending on this um, so the you know the, the story about the the elephant and the um, visually impaired um, uh, old men who were feeling the elephant. Some felt the trunk, thought it was a snake. Some felt the legs, thought it was pillars. Some felt the sides and thought it was a wall. You know, some felt the tusks and thought it was a sword. So the idea was they were all seeing aspects of it, um, and if they put it all together, they would have a better idea. Maybe it was an elephant that they were feeling. So that, that noise is me drinking Iron Brew. A conflict of interest declaration. I've got shares in the Iron Brew manufacturer uh, bars. So anyway, classification to use. Well, there's three things, values, context, and purposes. So um, there's all kinds of variety of values. 
uh, involved. One of them is ontological values, and that's how our kind of assumptions about the sort of nature of, of the problem. Uh, and so the thing is about people uh, and basically organisms is that we view what we encounter in terms of categories rather than dimensions. Um, but there's sort of different assumptions involved. They even call them mental health as a value choice. And to some people that's fighting talk uh, because it sort of implies health and to them it implies doctors. Um, and some people will call these like problems of living or psychological problems. And there's other issues like, do you view these sort of problems as being located in individuals or a sign of a dysfunction within it or broader problem within a broader context such as family societies and different like nomothetic versus a geographic. Um, so if you want to read more about that, I'll give you a, a reference there. Um, so nomothetic is the idea of sort of, sh I'll talk about, well, I'll, I'll illustrate that later on. So uh, purposes, well, what are you using it for? So for example, we Describing something or persuading other people to have got an accurate description or explanation of what's going on. Um, maybe they want to discover a cause or a mechanism, or so they, they want a classification that, that focuses on that. A clinician, on the hand, are more interested in things like practicality um, and it being able to give them useful information to help clinical decision making. Um, sometimes people want to, uh, my parent probably want to reduce stigma. Uh, and categorizations tend to be probably increase stigma to, to a slight degree um, because they're nomothetic. So they, they assume that everyone classified in such way have got some shared characteristic. Um, and then people might think there's more degree of sharing than, than, than going on than, than is safe. Okay, and next important fact is context. So if you're a, a doctor, a medical doctor, and you've got a busy clinic, um, or you're working with them night, seeing emergencies. Um, you probably want something that's quite simple, doesn't? Uh, so you don't have much cognitive uh, resources. So you can focus on all other things, not just because you've got pressure and time, but it might be the middle of the night. You might be tired. Uh, you you know the emergency. You you got to focus on the emergency rather than try to classify something. But people who've got, for example, an office-based practice, maybe seeing a few patients a day and the same patients for week after week, they can probably use a much more complex classification system. Uh, and again, depending on administrative requirements, I've said that in the health service, almost everyone probably will need a diagnosis on site because the health service runs in physical, uh, and basically health-based classification. And you also want to, you don't want to use something your colleagues don't use because I said, if you're gonna communicate with them, if you're speaking French and they won't really understand English, you're not gonna get very far. Um, and also some types of problems that you see. So some types of problems are more useful, some types of classifications than others. So for example, a psychotherapist or a counselor, people with them, maybe they don't get on with end or something like that. You know, a sort of medical-based classification might be less useful to them than say, me who's seeing people in the hospital in the middle of the night. Okay, so what are the particular problems of classifying mental health? Well, there's quite a few. Uh, and I'll just mention one or two here. So one is, of course, that the brain is the most complex. I've put the most complex organ in the body by far. In fact, it's the most complex object in the universe that we, are, that, that, that we know of, not just the organ. Um, I mean, obviously, a cardiologist, the heart, how complicated is the heart? It just pumps. Okay, this is some uh, one or two other hormones. But basically, it's just a pump. Relatively simple, isn't it? Whereas the brain is far more complicated and we, we don't really understand. Now we know we have faults, um, but how we, know we almost everyone accepts it's related to the brain. But what is the exact relationship still has been sorted out, like the mind body problem, the mind brain problem, whatever you call. So if you are thinking medically, physio scientific physiology and pathophysiology is poorly understood. And it's an extremely complex organ. And obviously, things like culture affects the brain and the mind far more than affects other parts of the body. So basically we can't visualize its functioning in terms of say, aspects like the mind. Uh, it's very complicated. Um, so we don't have the same sort of level of measuring outputs uh, that we have for other organs of the body.
So now I'm talking about why, how we classify. So one thing is you can think about what patient shares with all other patients, then what patient shares with some other patients. That's normal therapy. So if you identify with the students, some other patients, you can then get some data from it um, and then see what is unique to the patient. That's a geographic. Now, the problem with just looking at what's unique to the patient, uh, C, is that you can't learn from that patient to other patients because it's unique. If you just focus on what they share with some other patient, you'll lose um, important information about that individual. Okay. Uh, and if you do the same for everyone, you, you give everyone the same treatment and can't got no idea about prognosis. So you basically got to look at all these different aspects. So one idea is you don't have any classification. Uh, and that was put forward by McCreef, uh, one of our articles, effectively. Uh, and what that means is, is, well, they say is one can abjure, and I use that sort of moralistic term, classification for multiple reasons. It's not perfect. It's not perfect scientifically. Uh, it can give you comprehensive information. Well, nothing can give you comprehensive information. If you're a Kantian, uh, you believe that there's certain aspects of an object that will always be unknowable, the noumena. Um, so, yeah, we have no perfect scientific classifications of anything to do with the human body. Um, but physicians don't give up classification. Our argument is it can cause stigma, which is true, and it's not humanistic. And people confuse humanistic for humanitarian. It's not quite the same thing. And so we don't want to put people in boxes or jam jar, labels of a jam jars or something like that. But the problem is, is that what we're not, we're not classifying people, we're classifying their problems. Um, and without classification, you can't communicate with else. You'd have to describe every case and all details to every about every patient you see. Uh, can't be used for administrative purposes, for benefits, uh, etc. And it can't be used for scientific research. So you, there's no evidence-based practice. And you're not able to demonstrate you're effective as well because you just sit and say, well, this person's completely unique. The fact the case ended up really drastically was due to unique reasons. I have nothing to do with how crap I am as a practitioner. Well, you know, maybe that's partly why they suggest it. And you're given a reference there for why classification is inevitable. So why do we use categories? So I used to um, do a, like a film of Kenny Daglish going the runner for Scotland against England in Wembley. I think, I think he was not making Ray Clements. And I said, I can describe that in four, four words. Uh, good triumphing over evil. Because what it is, is that we have a raw stream of data that comes into ourselves and we've got to impose a structure on it to make sense of it, to operate on it, to make use of it, and then to remember it and recall it. And we, when we think abstractly, we use these same sort of uh, concepts and categories. And that's just how people think. In fact, it's probably our animals, our or probably our meat, I think, as well, process information. Um, and I suppose you think about it in nerves. Um, they, have, they sum up all this sort of information, and then they go or don't go. Um, and so generally how we have categories is prototypic or ideal forms. Uh, and so if you reckon, so for example, like a bird, we recognize a central example or an ideal form more quickly than it closer it is to a prototypical ideal. So we recognize a sparrow as an eagle as a bird more fast than we would recognize, say, an ostrich or a penguin. So they're slightly more unusual. And you can sort of categorize that. Now, at my previous talk, a lot of these slides will be familiar. So I'll try and rattle through it a bit quickly. So we use categories because they're not very complex resource dependent. And we often have to make categorical decisions and we work under pressure. So the kind of usefulness of diagnosis is it tells information like how a problem might present, what else might be present, what else it might be, uh, what often tends to go along with it, what kind of complications are associated with this condition, what the range of outcomes are, what type of treatments and responses we can expect. And how do we classify things? We can classify based on up to three shared characteristics. One is in the basis of clinical pictures, such as signs, symptoms, lab tests. So I've got here functional mental health diagnosis, many of them, depression, anxiety, things like high blood pressure type 2, IBS, diabetes. And then they might have changes in structure of processes. This is more explanatory, more useful, because then you can maybe know how to reverse it or prevent it. So it's things like Alzheimer's disease, so far we can't prevent it or reverse it. But altered dexamethasone suppression test in Korea. Now I've got MS there, but there's a paper out it's in Science recently. They think it might be due to Epstein-Barr virus. Um, but then how that Epstein-Barr virus 
then leads to you having MS. We don't know. Um, uh, MS, you've got uh, so type 1 diabetes, Parkinson's disease, and then you've got the causes of changes in structure process and etiological diagnosis of so infections such as TB, or if you've got hypothyroid induced depression or something like that. Um, and there's some people think that diagnosis should be essentialist. That means they should carve nature up uh, like a giant turkey. Um, and you should have zones of rarity between different diagnoses. And it's based in Sydenham. And his idea was that you would describe a syndrome, which is a collection of clinical features that associate together. And then that would then be as the implications would find the So one relationship between cause and clinical condition, uh, sort of presenting features, clinical syndrome. The problem is one clinical syndrome can have many different causes. Uh, so it's a one-to-many relationship. And there's also a, a many to uh, one to many, but also the other way around. Um, one disease can have um, many different associated clinical conditions, such as TB or syphilis in the class of examples. Um, so in a mental, mental health problems are particularly hard to separate. Uh, one issue about diagnosis, particularly in terms of talk about validity. Um, now, some people, when they say validity, they mean utility. Uh, other people mean often mean that it's independent of our mind. So stars would still exist if there are no humans there. Although quantum physics suggests, isn't this observer principle that you observe something and that affects how an event happens millions of light years away or something. But, and then other people suggest it's like zones of rarity between different conditions. So validity means different things. It doesn't mean something or true or use true or something like that in this context. It means a variety of things. I'll, I'll run through this quick, more quickly. So classic exam disease or syndrome where you've got a clear cut difference between different conditions and clear demarcation of health. I'll give some examples there, myocardial infarction that pops up later on, TB, melancholia was supposed to be a different, qualitatively different from sort of ordinary depression. BTs, Alzheimer's. And that's the syndrome syndrome. And so the clinician identifies unique syndrome and then the researcher finds a cause and the disease process is caused to meet syndrome. A common type is a spectrum of health, but you've got a spectrum of values in the community and we demarcate it and say some people, don't, some people don't. We have to do it for practical reasons to identify cases and do research. But obviously it's not much different. I have to stay on the side of the line, but a line has to be drawn. Um, I've got your metabolic syndrome emissions, diabetes, type two diabetes, high blood pressure. As well as things that probably most examples of common mental health problems, such as anxiety and depression. All right, my vulgaris, I've got there as well. Um, so nature of diagnosis, and this is spectrum of condition. This is where it's, you've got a sort of giant condition and we, we divided it for useful purposes as human clinicians. And it may or may not have a clear boundary with health. So COED, uh, type one diabetes, some people have argued the two types of diabetes in the spectrum, I'm not 100% convinced. Acute coronary syndrome, you go from typical angina to atypical angina to myocardial infarction with fuzzy boundaries between them all. Uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, connective tissue diseases, seronegative spondyl arthropathies, Parkinson's disease to lower body dementia, frontal temporal dementia to motor neuron disease, etc. Some people suggest a psychosis like this as well. And then you've got this more complicated issue where you've got basically a giant network, and we're going to mention networks later on, uh, underlying process of networks was creating multiple aspects. And these different aspects have given different diagnostic labels. And that might be because of recognizing different ways, whether it's raised blood pressure, raised sugar. Uh, it may be also because some of the treatments, although they may be similar, so for metabolic syndrome, it's like, eat, basically don't be a Glaswegian, uh, eat, eat well, exercise regularly, monitor your alcohol intake, etc. Um, and some of the treatments are complications can be different. So hypertensive I, uh, retinopathy is supposed to be different from diabetic retinopathy uh, as well. I mean, it is different, is it supposed to be? Uh, and uh, also some of the treatments are different. So I might give someone an ACE inhibitor for high blood pressure and a metformin, although that's not that great. I might give a big one, I think that's what it's for type 2 diabetes. So I've mentioned metabolic syndrome, the autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, uh, myeloplatter disorders, where people flip between different sort of um, conditions within a sort of giant condition. 
Um, and the dementia, so often people have got different disease processes going on and it's the predominant disease process that we give them the name. And some people, and this is gonna come into high top, we'll mention that later on, internalizing conditions such as fear and misery, fear of things like the phobias, panic, and misery things like depression, uh, generalized anxiety, worry, disorder. And then you've got externalizing disorders, sort of substance misuse, and some putative personality types. Another type of conditions you might classify are injuries. So obviously breaking your bones or being stabbed, but psychologically you might think like traumatic events or chronic trauma. And then you've got things of a variety of conditions, maybe interest to health or social care professionals. So termination of healthy pregnancy, well, not healthy pregnancy, termination of pregnancy is abnormality or risk or uh, acute risk to women's life. Um, that's not a disease, but obviously doctors get involved because we've got skills that can be useful. Plastic surgery, that's usually, a cosmetic plastic surgery is not for a disease, but plastic surgery is a skill to do it properly as opposed to um, someone with a syringe full of silicone or something. Also that pregnancy, pregnancy is not a disease, but doctors and midwives get involved because antenatal care improves healthcare outcomes. Um, and there's also a variety of problems where health may be, help may be sought for professionals and they need a diagnostic code or something like that uh, to pay the insurance or for their activity records. So I mentioned about validity. So some people suggest that, for example, psychosis diagnosis don't have validity because you can't separate them clearly at cross-sectional symptoms sometimes, but longitudinally you usually can. But actually even cross-sectional symptoms, it's, they've got high reliability for recognizing them. And they do have predictive value. So manic psychosis is much better. Usually tends to have a better outcome than the schizophrenia psychosis. And like lithium, we use lithium in bipolar disorder, but not schizophrenia. But some treatments effective in both, such as antipsychotics. Um, and also antidepressants in schizophrenia don't make you manic, but they can in bipolar disorder. And bipolar on average is less cognitive impairment than schizophrenia. Okay, you mentioned stigma and other drawbacks. If you continue, well, I'm doing this, hopefully I'll be able to talk about the other ones. So stigma and other drawbacks. If you can lose a whole picture, um, you can overforce people into an ill-matching category. And then doctors being doctors, um, we're kind of like, we are supposed to hold a diagnosis lightly, uh, but some of us kind of get attached and won't change it, even though the data is clearly showing it should be something else. Stigma, people often get associated with diagnosis, and that's why we've got terms like epileptic leper. Um, and you can also get self stigma, stigma from other people and from healthcare professionals. Um, and for some people, the stigma can be as distressing or more distressing than the condition itself. And there's also sort of reification when we sort of think of these diagnostic constructs, not uh, we think of them as diseases and syndromes, the very first time I talked about, not about the variety of different things they may be, such as a an area on a dimension or a spectrum. Okay. Another thing is diagnosis alone isn't a part of the treatment, even in general medicine. So when you uh, do your presentation to patient, your post date ward, you just don't say, consultants say to you, well, what's the problem? You just don't give them the diagnosis, do you? You give them a, a, a narrative, don't you, which involves you know, the patient's age and occupation, important relevant clinical data, like if they were heart disease, do they smoke or not? Uh, important uh, clinical presentations, summary of what treatment they've had and outcome. And you, what you do is the diagnosis is part of this narrative around the patient, the formulation, which helps, should help you guide the treatment and management of the patient. Um, and it should tell you why does this patient, particular patient present with this particular problem, this particular type, and still does it. And psychiatry trainees were taught a, a grid, aren't we? So along the top of the columns, um, we've got predisposing, precipitating, uh, perpetuating, protective. And then the roles are things like biological, psychological, social. So it's a biopsychosocial formulation. Um, so that's diagnosis. So that should be referring to people who attended my last talk. Um, the next talk, the next bit is dimensional models. So I've mentioned about dimensions. Why use them? Well, often things, the dimensions and categories are two sides of the same coin. Um, so something like hypertension, obviously, you've collapsed that dimension of blood pressure readings into hypertensive or not hypertensive, haven't you? You can subdivide it into mild or moderate or whatever. Um, now, 
You've applied that threshold, which loses information, but gains cognitive economy. Um, now, the thing is, diagnostic categories are often symptomatic, heterogeneous. So if all you just give is a diagnosis, you're not really giving much idea what kind of symptoms are happening in that, particularly for mental health. Whereas if you represent all the symptoms, uh, you can represent all in a dimension. In the form, if you can represent all the dimensions of the symptoms, you can represent the heterogeneity. Um, so one of the says, oh, well, you've got lots of diagnoses in mental health. You know, they often have more than one. Um, forgetting that, for example, people with metabolic syndrome often have more than one diagnosis. But they say, oh, well, instead of having lots of comorbid diagnosis, you have a comprehensive description of people's psychopathology, which is even more cumbersome. Uh, they still involve, for example, you know, people involved without making categorical bar. So if you see someone who's just taken some LSD, and you rate their psychotic symptoms, they'll score at least as high as someone I've got who meets the diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia for a period of time, then it will fade. So you, you can't differentiate those two unless you put some other categorical information in there, like I've excluded people who are acutely intoxicated or uh, uh, I've excluded the period of time when they're intoxicated, etc. So you make some categorical choice and they're quite useful for people who, for they don't have to cognitive uh, resource of uh, economy of cognitive resources isn't that important. So if you've only got a few patients, office hours, etc., you've got the time to comprehensively describe these things. So as I said, they often involve categorical choices. So for example, if you just did your mental health symptoms, you might, for example, miss that someone has got hyperthyroidism and just depression. Unless somehow you've got something saying, I've excluded anyone who's Conditions are caused, clearly caused by general medical conditions. Uh, dimensions can lose data. So, for example, uh, if you just rely on cross sectional dimensional symptom data, you lose their history. Um, so, someone could be fine now, but six weeks ago, they could have been very unwell. But their scores now might be similar to anyone dragged off the street. So, you've lost that data. And there is no, unlike diagnosis, which has got two established systems, ICD, the international one which everyone has to use, uh, and DSM, which a lot of people use for research uh, and in the States and States and those kind of places like Australia. Um, there is no one established dimension system covering all mental health problems. And even the civil dimensional representation stack there's lots of disagreement on what's the best way to do it. Um, and a corollary of that is there's much less research to make evidence-based using dimensions, which then means you've got evidence-based patterns that's going to be less based on evidence. Um, but dimensions, because they're very complicated, can have um, greater predictive value. So if you think about diagnosis is like one bit of information, and dimension is like multiple bits of information. So the more information you feed into a system, the better prognostic you can get. But the gain you get reduces with each additional bit. So what I've got here is called high top. You can Google that. Um, and Abbas Aftab, who I know through Twitter, um, he's now in the consortium of it. So this is quite a complicated system. Uh, and so I'll go through it. So, so look at the bottom, we've got signs and symptoms. And above that, you've got symptom components and maladaptive traits. Then above that, you've got these syndromes, which are equivalent to diagnosis. So things like dysthymia, GAD, on the left hand, somatic symptom disorder, uh, believe it. So, and then above that, they go into sub-factors like sexual problems, eating problems, fear, distress, mania, substance use, antisocial behaviour. And then above that, you've got so the, the, the spectrum, which is like internalising, which I mentioned before, externalising, which is spent to significant antagonistic, etc. And you've got higher order dimensions. So now the good thing, now this is empirically based on large amounts of data and studies. Um, and what they do is call fact analysis and try and identify what, what's the best way of representing how symptoms associate in both clinical and non-clinical populations. So you start with the bottom the symptoms, which then eventually build up into syndromes, and then that goes to sub factors. And it's, it's empirically based. And what they show is a continuity between non-clinical and clinical severity, but it does tend to exclude. So if you look, I can't say anything really about dementia, it's not going to exclude things like um, hypothyroid induced depression. There, you'd have to put that separately. And uh, for example, the idea of using it, 
it will do complete a questionnaire, which takes about 40 minutes, and then feed it into a computer, and then that will give you the classification. Now, that fits a certain way of practice, and fits a certain group of patients. It's not really feasible to do it with acute lung well patients in the AD department, or if you do the whole visit before you go over. So it suits a certain type of patient. But what it gives you, it gives you a comprehensive, if you think, if you complete all this, you've got a comprehensive list of the symptoms. Okay, at that particular time. Of course, theoretically, to get course, you then have to do it for six months, one year, et cetera, et cetera. But it's fantastic. And it's great for researchers because researchers can have a comprehensive uh, picture of symptoms and then they can try and look at mechanisms that cause it. So it's great for research and some clinicians and some type of problems. And hopefully it can then be used to describe better diagnostic categories than the ones we have. So the ones we have at the moment are mostly based on clinical tradition. I think that's my dog trying to come in. Oh, no. Wait, <laughs> It's all right. So anyway, the next one is symptom-based classification. And some suggest they're using symptoms or specified problems. That works quite well for, for a variety of things that don't really fit the idea of having symptoms, does it? So it, it might be something like, uh, like you don't get on with... Uh, you're having marital issues, or you might be having something like um, a self-esteem issue, or some of the kind of thing that you see a counselor or a psychotherapist for. Um, or you might have particular symptoms. And that idea is, well, if you just, because it said diagnostic catch is quite heterogeneous, so it's two different people with the same diagnosis, kind of very little symptoms in common. Um, we, if you just look at the symptoms, but they'll be much more homogenous, and that allow you to do things like research mechanisms, uh, and treatments because they'll all be the same rather than diagnosis they might be a bit different they might be quite different clinically um, and it's often people who hate diagnosis such as Bentham and Kinderman and these are people who are academics and don't do emergency work they tend to see people few people uh, in office hours um, and it's it's based on the myth that symptoms themselves are homogenous they're not really so if you've got insomnia due to amphetamines depression or mania Quite different. The symptoms the same. and treatments are different, aren't they? And the thing is that symptoms do aggregate. So high top is based on the idea that symptoms are associated with patterns. So if you're just, you know, you kind of what you're doing, you're seeing the tree, but you're not seeing the wood. Okay, and um, the amount of symptoms that people have would be impractical for evidence-based practice and for administrative purposes. If you're laboriously recording the form, every symptom that someone has, well, when are you going to do the work? And also, uh, if you see someone, like I said, say someone has got insomnia and they also have a latent mood, you know, where's your, you know, and multiple, how are you going to find that in the research? And are you going to apply insomnia look for people who are depressed? To that group it's just it's impractical it's good for some types of issues but it's generally it's impractical solution okay but i'll give you a good example but and this might be uh, more of an idiomic which we'll talk about later but this is uh freeman's cognitive model delusion model and the good thing about this model i think it's quite medical in a way remember i said about causes well actually what clinicians are interested in when it would cause is two things one thing is prevention if you know what ultimately causes something you can do a prevention for it, you can get for example, a COVID vaccine. Um, now, it doesn't, COVID accident doesn't actually prevent you getting it much, but it does seem to prevent it getting very sick. But you can also get things like cervical cancer seems related to HPV. You give people the HPV vaccine and hopefully that cervical cancer. Um, and today, I think uh, uh, we'll be able to send you um, the slides afterwards if you ask for it. Um, so the good thing about, the thing that actually doctors, when they say cause, what they mean is maintaining factors. That is, why does someone still have this problem? And what can we do to address it? So Freeman, uh, he got, he's done a very successful CBT for delusions trial. And he said, look, the fact you have to look at things that worry. So I do see patients whose delusions are maintained by excessive anxiety. If you've got kind of negative self-police, like you think they're People that are dislikable, everyone dislikes them. They might get persecutory thoughts, anomalous experiences. Um, so people have um, unusual experiences that they're trying to understand why they're still having, they're trying to explain it. 
uh, uh, sleep dysfunction. It's, it's shown that if people don't sleep very well, it tends to promote uh, delusional thinking as well as other mental health problems. In fact, there's a trial that showed that if you address insomnia, you might prevent depression. I'll come to that later. Uh, reasoning biases. So if you jump to conclusions, although data actually for delusional people is jumping to conclusions probably isn't a big factor, maybe not significant. And things like safety behaviours. Um, the reason that, you, that the IRA didn't blow you up was because you stayed in your house and it's not because the IRA were not going to kill you anyway. Okay, so that's an example of a sort of a, a sort of one type of symptom and it's kind of like analysed and it's come up with ideas of how to treat it, therapy. Okay, so now we come to networks and networks are a big thing in general medicine as well, particularly for the, the, the potentiality of uh, precision medicine. The idea you find a precise pathway that's causing the particular problem that particular person, then you can address it. Um, and obviously that's got um, lots of commercial interests. But anyway, so this idea of psychopathology is that the actual mental health condition is caused by the interplay between symptoms and network structure. That is the symptoms cause each other. So we look at there, symptom four is linked to symptom three, symptom three is linked to symptom two, symptom one, and there's E, which is external field, and I'll explain that in a second. And so the symptoms here are nodes, and the connections between nodes are causal interactions between nodes. But the implication is that if you can break them, you break the symptoms. So the idea is, is that unlike, say, a latent model, that there's something underlying it that then causes symptoms. It's, it's also causes you to start thinking, performing less well, and then start doubting yourself, and more likely to be prone to depressed ruminations. And then that's the actual depression. So the idea is when you address insomnia, you might improve the depression. Okay. So I've mentioned external fields. They can activate symptoms, or they can modulate in other ways. So it can be external to the person, such as being bullied or being bereaved. And um, it can be internal factors. So for example, concept of information being linked to depression or genetic facts of increasing vulnerability, or maybe some cognitive styles. Uh, I'll mention them a bit later on. So central nodes can be identified networks suggesting fruitful targets and etiological research and clinical intervention. So something's connecting lots of sort of different symptoms together. If you target them, you might have a sort of synergistic effect in busting lots of things, isn't it? Um, and as I said, general medicine is also thinking about using network models. Okay. So if you look at the bridging symptoms, um, so you've got two symptom networks, A and B, and then you've got the bridge symptoms, uh, five and six, which links to th that network A through three and network B uh, through probably six and seven. Okay. That's great. Isn't it? Lovely diagrams. We love diagrams. And the thing is, if you can identify particular consistent network symptoms, then you can give them diagnostic labels, don't you? So, for example, if symptom network A was reliably identified across lots of different people, you could give it a name, couldn't you? And you'd give it diagnostic criteria based on one, two, three, four. And say, so if they've got four, they've got this diagnosis. Um, and then you get the benefit of a diagnostic cognitive economy resource system. Uh, and we've tried to identify these different networks, a variety of issues. The problem is, is that there's no universal network. It always varies differently between each study. Uh, and it's about like dimensions. Um, what do they do, for example, psychosis, the dimensional model of psychosis? It's great for that particular sample they have, but then you then apply it to a different sample. It doesn't work as well. Um, and they're usually created using statistical analysis symptoms and participants, but there is a kind of challenge in saying that just because two nodes are connected, are they just correlated or causal? And what's the direction of causality? I've given a quote for you to read a bit further. Okay, I hope the speed's all right. Now, this is a bit of a difficult one. So think of that uh, table I'm thinking. So at the top of the rows, they've got genes, molecules, cells, circuits, physiology, behavior, and self-reports. You notice that's very biological, isn't it? Self-reports is only psychological right there. Behavior is probably psychological as well, uh, but that's more sort of observed, isn't it? And then what you've got is um, how uh, your development also affects it and the value affects it. So you're basically analyzing problems using those kind of 
identifying what changes in circuits they have, what changes in genes they have, what kind of changes in cells they have, et cetera, and how that affects behavior and self-reports. And kind of issues you look at things like negative balance, positive balance, cognitive symptoms, et cetera. Okay. So this is called RDOC, and this was introduced by INCEL, INSEL, not INCEL. And he um, used to be head of the US National Institute of Mental Health. So diagnosis, um, this, I should tell you, the problem with diagnosis is mental health is they've not really, as I said, merely the base and symptoms. They've not really helped to identify common structures or process changes or common causes. So he said, let's go back. And what we'll do is we'll look at these different things, like acute threat, potential threat, loss, frustrated and reward, that kind of thing. And then we'll try and work out what the pathways involve from gene circuits all the way up to behavior and self-report. Okay. So these are invested, these are called units of units of analysis and to create a multi-level understanding of how these behaviors, observed behaviors and self-reports and experiences occur. And so you get an idea of physiology, psychophysiology, and then psychopathophysiology. But it's got a heavy biological focus. It doesn't really focus so much on contextual factors and personal meaning. In specific subdomains that match these clinical problems. I don't hear people coming to see saying, I've got frustrated, the problem is doctor, I've got frustrated and unreward. Not had that yet. Or um, I've got negative balance, doctor. I've got a bad case. I never hear that. So our doc is a, a useful method for understanding how we get perhaps certain kind of phenomenon, but whether it'll be clinically useful, I don't know. Um, next, ideographic. So I've talked about what is unique to the individual. So you might have a narrative of the life. What's the views that influence the culture of particular views? Meaning of what's happened to the person. And it's an important part of care, but it, it, it doesn't, it's hard to generate evidence from it to help the next person. So it helps to treat, uh, you know, Osler, the Canadian, not American physician, I think he's really British, who said, treat the disease, not the person. And also Hippocrates said it as well, didn't he? So, no, no, treat the person, not the disease. I got it the wrong way around, sorry. Treat the person, not the disease. I was too obsessed with thinking about whether it was Canadian or not. So treat the person, not the disease. So the idea is you need to know about the person. Um, and that's your patient. It's not lung cancer that's your patient. It's Mrs. Miggins who's got lung cancer, who uh, needs diagnostic criteria for lung cancer. It's Mrs. Miggins that's your patient. So you need to know about Mrs. Miggins. Um, so yeah, use it in conjunction with nomothetic methods to give you an important vital view of the individual patient, but it's not really a form of classification itself. Now you can use some psychological formulations which are purely a geographic, um, but how can you prove they're effective? I mean, you could do research to show this is an effective method, but effective at whom? At some point you've got to have a classification system to say who it's effective in. Otherwise you're just relying on expert announcements of expertness. Anyway, so now we've got, uh, I think we're doing all right. So you've got idiomic for time, idiomic and idiomographic. So this is the idea you do an idiographic sort of formulation of the individual facts involved, but you identify concepts, shared descriptions of concepts or previously encountered concepts, shared with other causes. And then these allow you to think about what to do with these kind of particular concepts. So you do the idiographic thing and you identify some sort of common shared element and through your training, you know, and research has shown, hopefully, this is the kind of thing you do to help, okay? The problem is, again, like the other, well, it's got little administrative or social utility. You can't put this in an application for, for benefits, for instance, and you can't write it down, uh, you know, for your activity recording. Now, a particular type is psychodynamic. Um, I've got a reference there for descriptions of defense mechanisms. Um, this is second time, obviously, it was started by Dr. Freud. And psychological formulation as a whole is less reliable. As in, people are much less likely to agree, shared agreement about a case than diagnosis. Although second formulation is probably in the same ballpark as psychiatric diagnosis on average. Um, and it seems that defense mechanisms, psychological stages, um, some are more mature. Uh, such as sublimation or functional. So that's when you divert your kind of desires into doing good instead as a way of 
getting the reward, and some are very primitive, such as projection, splitting, etc. Okay. Uh, cognitive behavioral, there's a recent article I've I'm linked, I'm linked to there. So, slightly matter of behavior analysis, and that's got antecedent behavior consequence. And presume the behavior is the one you want to target. So, you look what happens before and what happens as a result. And so what you're trying to understand is what are the triggers and also what is conditioning. So, what happened as a result? Was this reinforced in some way? Uh, did something unpleasant go away or did something pleasant to the person happen? So, what you can identify to try and modify the people so the target behavior. Um, then you've got the second wave, and that's from Beck. That's things like your counter distortion, such as black and white thinking. So that's really to a football fan, isn't it? One minute you're going to win the league, the treble, everything else. The next minute you're going to get relegated. So you've got no in between. Um, minimization, magnification. So you can uh, like minimize what's good and magnify what's bad. Arbitrary inference. You can uh, randomly check, look at one particular negative aspect and ignore everything else. You might have a to-do list and all you can see is the one thing you've not done and the 12 things you have done. Okay, and then you can then expand to general beliefs or schemas about how the world's organized, what about yourself and other people. And these can give rise to specific negative automatic thoughts. And now we've got third wave, and that looks at processes like cognition, affect, attention, I can't see it anymore. Let me get the chat. Attention, self, motivation, overt behavior. Okay. Uh, and they do things like cognitive diffusion, sort of mindfulness, that kind of thing. How, how to avoid getting overwhelmed by affect, uh, how to distance from things, how to look, you know, all these different varieties. And it's kind of scientifically based in studies of uh, these processes and outcomes. Okay. Well, there we go. So the power threat meaning framework, it seems to be the fit in a very almost official model of the British Psychological Society. They published it. I think it's useful, it can be useful in therapy as sort of understanding how contextual factors have, have led to this current problem. But I'm not so sure it identifies what, what you can do about it. Um, it's non-comprehensive. So lots of conditions are excluded, such as ADHD and dementia, although secondary problems caused by it can be classified used that way. It's basically got seven diagnoses. That's what they are. Seven provisional patterns, pattern recognition. That's what we're doing diagnosis. Um, it's got seven. And if they just stuck to that, it'd be fine. The problem is they've got a whole raft of it going on about diagnosis in a highly inaccurate way. And it's been written by basically the professional warriors are basically guild warriors. And they've not given evidence of validity, apart from their theoretic theories. There's no evidence, evidence in terms of utility. Very little. There's some kind of things, you know, we did this and it was great. Uh, or we did this and patients said they liked it. It's fine, but you don't know if patients were saying that because you know you don't want to upset the therapist. Uh, and there's no data and reliability. So it's kind of like it's basically overhyped. It's interesting. That may be useful in time, but it, it's not comprehensive, it's more psychotherapy. Now, interesting is systems formulation. So if you look at sort of like a social network, and certain individuals may display certain behavior, but the other thing about power threat many here, Mark. What they've said is that, so someone's exerted on uh, context, uh, contextual factors and stresses, and then how they respond to these threats are described as symptoms, but these responses may be perfectly understandable in the context of what's happened in their lives. So that's a good systems formulation. So maybe there's some people describe display behaviors that then lead to them being labeled as sick one. But in fact, what you're showing is, is this, there's a problem that tar social network around that person, and this person's particularly showing behavior. So for example, um, there may be domestic violence in the house, uh, and the child in the school is, for example, being aggressive to its peers. So the child's one is labeled as being half the problem. But in fact, if you analyze it, the child's only just displaying behaviors that it's witnessing at home. So uh, for example, in family therapy, you look at the entire family and see what's happening in the family, to try and help these relationships. Uh, and, you know, for example, as someone who's bullied, um, who's got the problem? You know, it, someone gets suicide out of bullying. Well, we label the person who's being bullied as having a problem, perhaps. We say they're depressed. We're not actually labeling as having being the problem. We're saying they're so distressed they need help with that. But the issue is who's, who's got the bigger problem? That person, the people bullying them. Okay. So the idea of assistance formulation is to look at the wider contextual network of this of the person that exists in, 
and what is going on in that network and then what you can do to address it in order to uh, help everyone in the system. And if some behaviours or expressions regard as problematic, then hopefully they will subside as what's provoking them so it is reduced. Okay, so uh, you'd be pleased to hear, oh, I've managed to keep the time reasonably well. So there are many different ways of viewing, modeling and describing and classifying mental health problems. What you choose depends on what your purposes and values are. And classification is multiple pro roles, such as administrative, communication between professionals, aiding clinical decision-making, research, and other roles such as, uh, um, such as uh, statistics and access and eligibility for, bene uh, eligibility for benefits. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, because uh, we've got a physical health system that uses diagnosis, uh, the law is going to be, looks like there will always be a role for diagnosis in, in, in mental health as well, because the healthcare system doesn't have this uh, organisational bandwidth to have multiple different classification systems. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. You can use them with each other. Um, they can give useful information for each other. So, for example, high talk may generate, uh, hopefully will generate useful diagnostic categories than the ones we have. Uh, and no single model will tell us everything we need to know about patients. We need to use multiple models to help us fully understand the patient. And you'd be pleased to know I've come to the end. So you can ask me any questions. Harry, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a lot to chew on there. Um, really, really fascinating. Um, something fascinating, but um, quite disorientating, I think, about kind of disseminating the map and kind of taking all the nodes and, and replacing um, those kind of different factors in different orders. Um, but really, really fascinating stuff uh, that we've been discussing there. Sammy, how long have you have you got for any questions that we might have? Uh, to about eight. Till about eight. Okay, so we've got a couple, a couple of minutes for a, for a little quick chat. So a bit you... longer. Five, see if it's five past eight, whichever is five past eight. Okay, we'll see how we we'll see how we get on, but um, no later than five past eight. Um, if you'd like to ask a question to Dr. Huda, you can do so by writing a comment in the chat, um, or if you want to ask an anonymous question, you can send it to me, uh, William Smith, in um, in the in the chat there. Um, so I guess I wanted to start off by um, asking you about kind of diagnosis um, as sort of the primary um, model that we have of classifying mental illness um, and now I've seen some research which has um, suggested that there are such problems with psychiatric uh, diagnosis that it makes it kind of scientifically meaningless. Um, I wonder what you think of that kind of research and the kind of challenges of diagnosis um, and as a kind of follow-up to that what you think would be um, an alternative or, or do you think there is a better way um, that we might consider looking at things or what would be the second best if not? I think people say about diagnosis, it's like they're not usually stating their own values, purposes, and contexts, are they? Um, and that would say about diagnosis, it's useful for some people's purposes, but not for others in certain ways of working. So I think what they're saying is, is diagnosis isn't useful for them, which is fine. Um, but the issue is, is that we work in a, a system like the NHS, which has to have a centralised administrative context so and we also importantly work in a context of the welfare system which it struggle you know it, it's it, it can only it's not going to use a separate system for mental health and physical health so for practical reasons uh real world reasons um diagnosis is needed for administrative purposes and social purposes um and also, most of the evidence is in the form of diagnosis as well. So if you want to do evidence-based practice, a lot of it does involve looking at diagnosis. Now, that's not saying the current diagnostic system is perfect, it's far from perfect, but we have to improve it. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we can get rid of diagnosis for a host of clinical, well, practical reasons, but also in clinical practice. Uh, if I'm seeing people at two in the morning, I'm not going to be saying to him, what, what I want you to do is fill in a 40-minute questionnaire. Uh, Mr. Catatonic Person, I want you to fill, fill in this 40-minute questionnaire. I'm going to put it into a computer, and after that, I'm going to come and talk to you. 
because that's just not practical, is it? So I think it, it, diagnosis in clinical practice uh, isn't useful for everyone or for every particular purpose, and it might not be useful for researchers, whatever. But at the moment, it's it's inescapable. Um, but what you use in clinical practice um, depends on how you work and what purposes you want to use it. So, yeah, I think for for doctors who've got heavy workloads and work in emergencies and stuff, they'll still use diagnosis. Other people can use other things. People will still have to use diagnosis for application benefits, administrative purposes, statistics, etc. Is there any other system that you use or any other thing that you think is useful I, as a psychiatrist? So, for example, I use a brief uh, dimensional system because uh, I work mostly in psychosis. So almost everyone I'll see, I'll use what's called the CGIS, Clinical Global Impression Scale Schizophrenia. And that's four dimensional scales on an overall scale. So I'll record that almost every clinical encounter because I've got the data for my normal clinical assessment. It takes me like a minute, half a minute to write it out. So I'll do that. Uh, as an addition to the data, and when ICD-11 comes out, uh, I think we've got a five or six item dimensional scale. So I'll switch to that when ICD-11 starts being used. So you can mix and match. Fascinating stuff. Um, again, if you've got any questions, please um, please pop them in the chat there. Um, I guess my my next um point i was going to raise was taking us kind of right back up to the the top before we even started really own classification but just talking about um we're talking about this canteen idea you said some objects um will always be um some, some aspects of objects will always be unknowable um yes and i guess that is always the case there's definitely this feeling and so I've studied a bit of neuroscience before I came to be interested in um, psychiatry yeah. specifically that in the future we're going to be getting to that point where there is um, all, we almost know everything that we can know I wonder where where you think the limits of our knowledge are in terms of because I suppose classifying we're trying to we're trying to disseminate you know yeah. what mental illness is and I wonder where you think the limits of, of what we can do so, are. for example consciousness they call it the hard problem of consciousness. And there was a paper a few years ago that says that we'll sort it in 50 years. But I'm sure 50 years ago, people thought they were going to sort it in 50 years. So the mind brain problem is possible. It may be intractable. Um, and it may not be amenable to uh, nomothetic research. So there's a theory called anomalous monism uh, by Davidson, I think. And he said that, well, you see, yes, Every, every mental state is correlated with a specific kind of physical state, but that's a monism bit. So a mental state is equivalent to a physical state, but he said you can't predict the mental state from the physical state, which would, uh, and that presumably I think part of it is, is that it varies between individuals. So um, uh, thinking about Kenny Dagley scoring against England would have a particular physical representation in my brain uh, but in someone else's brain, it might have a different physical representation, which means that if you wanted to identify the physical representation of Kenny Dagley's score against England, it's impossible to find it out because me and individual B would be completely different in how we physically represented it. So, an evolution depends on physical reproduction of things. Um, and so it does suggest that there's certainly an element of common physicality about representation, mental content, otherwise evolution couldn't operate. Um, but yeah, so I think w w there's always gonna be lots of things we don't know about something, um, and particularly the mind brain, because it's just uh, mind bogglingly complicated. I mean, as I said, the heart, the heart is simple. The heart's just a pump. <laughs> 